Hey everybody, it's Crypto Anarchist, and I'm back with another video today. Um, there's a little break from videos because I went on a uh, vacation for a week, so that's that's just what happened. Uh, I just wasn't here, so couldn't make any videos. Um, but anyways, today we're going to be talking about uh, why or ten reasons why crypto won't recover. Now, I'm probably one of the biggest crypto bulls that has ever lived. Um, but I'm bullish on crypto for the right reasons, which means that I'm bearish on crypto in the short term. Very bearish. Like, super bearish. I'm, I'm not sure why 90% of crypto exists, and I want it to die, because if it doesn't die, then crypto will never succeed. Um, there's a lot of shit that the entire crypto community is getting so wrong right now, and it's just been so terrible for crypto as a whole. We're not getting anywhere. Um, so I want to give you guys 10 reasons why I think crypto won't recover. Um, obviously, like, you know, I think crypto will eventually recover, but there's, we got to fix these problems. We got to fix these problems. Otherwise, crypto won't recover. Otherwise, crypto is a complete waste of time and we're doing absolutely nothing. Um, so the, the first five reasons here on this page, let's go, with, let's go with number one here. Just Bitcoin's, it's less functional than it was in 2013. Um, this isn't even really debatable. Like, Bitcoin's being used by less and less people. Transactions before 2013, they were always nearly instant. They would always, you know, get into the next block. You didn't have to worry about high fees. Now, um, it's it's a thing that you have to worry about. Like, oh, hopefully blocks don't get too congested, so we have $50 fees, and you know, hopefully I'll be able to get my transaction in the next block. And I know at, at the current time, like right now. Uh, congestion is not an issue, but congestion was never an issue before 2013. Congestion has been a huge issue um, nowadays, and that's why all these internet retailers are getting rid of Bitcoin, because it's just useless. It's useless to use Bitcoin, BTC, uh, Bitcoin SegWit or whatever. It's useless to use it as if you're a merchant. There's no point to it. It's not reliable. Um, it's just it's a terrible form of payment. And I don't know, it's kind of weird that we're trying to create a new form of money that retailers won't accept because it's just useless um, and, and obviously there's the volatility question too um, the volatility question is something else but uh, uh, you know Bitcoin was always volatile before um, that enough was a big enough problem but now it's volatile and it's not always useful for transactions um, that alone just boggles my fucking mind how people have been okay with that um, like hey let's have a currency that can't be used as currency like what, what the fuck does that mean moving on the, the Bitcoin Lightning Network, uh, one, it's pretty much a joke. Nobody uses it. It's very like it's very easy to get all your money stolen. There are certain smart contracts within the Lightning Network that will take your money if they think you're a hacker, um, and they don't even have to prove you're a hacker. There's been people who have t gotten their money stolen from them by the Bitcoin Lightning Network because the Lightning Network thought they were trying to steal from people, but they were, it was just user errors or bugs. Uh, like lightning's terrible. Um, you even see people like uh, Cobra said, you know, don't use lightning for years. Uh, and Bitcoin Lightning, like it was supposed to be out years ago. I remember hearing about it in 2013. Okay, so after five years, Bitcoin Lightning basically doesn't do shit, and it's not supposed to be ready for years. Like, how long does it take to do this? You know, <clears throat> I'd assume most of this has to do with the problem that's laid out here in number three, and that's the uh, the rooting issue and the fractional reserve issue. So there's two massive massive issues with Bitcoin Lightning. The first one's the rooting issue. Now, I'm actually going to use Vitalik Buterin to uh, help me out on this one, because Vitalik Buterin, back at Deconomy, when he called out Craig Wright, a lot of people thought, like, you know, ha ha, Vitalik Buterin's making Bitcoin cash and Craig Wright looks stupid, but he actually made the Lightning Network and the Plasma Network look stupid because he admitted that the, the rooting problem is NP-hard. He said it. He knows it. And then he says, oh, but we'll just make heuristic solutions that are that are pretty good in practice. And it's like, well, there's an issue with heuristics for rooting problems because the rooting problem gets exponentially more, um, it gets exponentially more difficult the more users you have because then, I mean, the way the rooting problem, uh, the way the math works, it's all uh, permutations and commutations. So the more people that you have, like, it's exponentially a larger problem that you have to solve. It's ex I think it's actually, permutations are actually worse than exponentially, so I think it's worse than an exponentially increasing difficulty, which is, that's fucking insane to talk about, you know, that's that's mentally retarded to say. Um, so, as Lightning and the Plasma Networks, like, get used more, they get exponentially less effective. More than exponentially less effective. <laughs> and that we're just supposed to be okay with that? And again, the only, the only real solution to this is to centralize the network, okay? So, Lightning's not going to work, they're just going to have to centralize it. Um, 
that's terrible. And the second reason that they're going to have to centralize it and beyond the rooting problem is the fractional reserve problem. So again, I've talked about this a million times. Now, Bitcoin Lightning is not a fractional reserve banking system. Okay, Every time I say it's a fractional reserve system, people are like, oh, it's not a fractional reserve banking system. I know that. I'm saying it's a fractional reserve blockchain system. Okay, Fractional reserves have a very specific meaning. Okay, So when, with fractional reserve banking, uh, what happens is that a bank only holds a fraction of deposits in reserve that are required if everyone tries to withdraw all their money at once okay and so the problem with this is that if everyone does try to withdraw all their money at once you have something called a bank run everyone loses their money the only way to stop this bank run is to freeze withdrawals at the bank right so with with cryptocurrencies um, Oh, and the whole reason that the, the fractional reserve banking exists, it's a Keynesian idea, and it's because uh, Keynesians hate when you have liquidity just sitting in savings accounts. They think that's useless and it's a waste of money. And so what they do, well, the reason they do fractional reserve banking is it allows a bank to loan out your liquidity uh, to other users who would be, you know, using that liquidity. And they say that helps things out. It, it, it doesn't. It causes, it causes bank runs. It causes the business cycles. Um, it's it's mentally retarded. You can't steal from someone and stay, like just think like oh it's gonna, everything's going to be okay. But with uh, with a blockchain, the difference between fractional reserve banking and fractional reserve blockchains is that with blockchains, your liquidity lies in the blockchain. And a very easy way to understand this is imagine that Bitcoin from its inception had zero megabyte blocks. It had zero block space. Okay, if Bitcoin had zero block space, that means Bitcoin would have zero transactions, right? So your liquidity in a blockchain is the blockchain space. The way that Bitcoin Lightning works is that you loan out your blockchain space that is reserved for your transactions on the second layer network, on the Lightning network, and you loan that out to the Lightning hubs on the uh, on the main blockchain uh, layer. So the issue here again is that with it's it's fractional reserve it's a fractional reserved blockchain because if everyone tries to withdraw all of their money from the second layer network from the lightning network uh, they won't have space on the blockchain because there's only a fraction reserve or a fraction of the blockchain reserved for withdrawals that is needed if everyone need, actually were to withdraw at one time so there's a fraction of blockchain held in reserve that is needed rather than having a hundred percent of blockchain held in reserve that is needed there's only a fraction Okay, like by definition of what SegWit does to a blockchain, it makes it a fractional reserve blockchain system. And again, I've talked about this before. They even talked about this in the Bitcoin Lightning white paper. The problem with this is, is it literally creates bank runs uh, for blockchains. And the only way to stop these bank runs in these blockchains is to uh, freeze withdrawals. And the way that the bank run works in the blockchain, it's a little bit different than a bank run in a fractional reserve banking system. In a bank run in a fractional reserve banking system, your money disappears. It's gone. It's literally gone. And that's because when they are loaning out your liquidity, Liquidity to other people, they're actually loaning out your money. But in a fractional reserve blockchain system, uh, when there's a bank run, your money doesn't disappear. It's just that the only time the bank run happens is when there's a massive drop in price in that cryptocurrency. So your money gets locked up for potentially years, and during that time, your money's value will drop to zero. So you don't actually lose your money; you just lose the value of your money. Okay? So you don't, if you don't have the liquidity of your money, you're fucked. Like there's no point in having money if you don't have the liquidity of it. But again, yeah. So fractional reserve banking, fractional reserve blockchain systems um, they're similar they're not exactly the same the big problem with this fractional reserve blockchain issue is that once Austrian economics or Austrian economists start to understand this this will become the new interesting thing as far as theory is concerned because nobody exactly knows the full implications of what fractional reserve blockchains uh, do um, just because they would create sort of bank run issues uh, they would create a sort of business cycle in the same way that fractional reserve banking does but it's very interesting to try and figure out how exactly this all plays out and I'm pretty sure I'm the only person I swear to God I'm the only person alive who's talking about this so as soon as other people start understanding this you know Austrian economists will start looking at it and they'll be like wow this is very interesting I wonder what all the theoretical implications are and they'll start talking about that and that's really going to be bad for Bitcoin because a lot of the original people in Bitcoin were Austrian or people who believed in the uh, Austrian theory of economics and uh, they They'll drop Bitcoin like a rock when they realize it's just a fractional reserve banking system, or at least Bitcoin's SegWit. Um, the fourth thing I want to talk about here is the uh, the dis decentralized and trustless misunderstanding. And I'm going to quote a guy. I'm going to I'm going to screw up his name here. Kai Kai Stinkholm. Um, you know what? I, you know, I'm sorry for butchering your name there, guy. But uh, this is probably the best anti-crypto. Uh, article I've ever seen. There's, he's got a couple of them actually, and he's 
basically dead on. The problem is, is that he's like he's slightly incorrect because he's using the popular interpretation of cryptocurrencies by the cryptocurrency community. The one thing that I will tell you guys about the cryptocurrency community is they have no fucking idea what they're talking about. Basically, everybody involved in cryptocurrencies is a complete idiot when it comes to cryptocurrencies, and that's fine. It's just the problem is, is that they're they. they they keep trying to push things that will never work, and this guy blows apart a lot of the things that people keep talking about. And the one of the one of the main thing, or two of the main things I want to talk about is the decentralized and the trustless aspects of blockchain. So, blockchains are only decentralized and trustless insofar as their mining mining is concerned. That's it. That's the only thing that is decentralized and trustless. You don't have to have centralized control over the miners to get them to work for you. You don't have to trust the miners to get them to work for you. That's it. Okay, that's it. The miners are going to put into a transaction whatever you tell them to put in. That's the decentralized and trustless aspect of blockchain. That's as far as it goes. Everyone tries to say, like, oh, we can decentralize and make trustless, you know, entire supply chain management. It's just come use our Walton chain coin. <laughs> that's not how these things work. Okay, the, you cannot, like, the info that you put into a blockchain is only as good as the person who put it in there, right? And so what I mean by this is a lot of people will say things like, oh, hey, you know, if you use uh, a supply chain crypto management thing, you can have end-to-end, -end, uh, or you can have integrity from your supply management end to end and it's like you realize that all you have to do to uh, lie about you know the integrity of your blockchain data is you just have to input incorrect data again the whole reason that a blockchain is decentralized and trustless is because the miners will do whatever you tell them so that means if you lie to the miners in your transaction they will put out a transaction that is a lie so if you have some sort of supply chain management blockchain and you're like oh hey this make sure that all your bananas are organic um, all all you know, all the producer of that banana has to do is, you know, they can spray pesticides on their banana and just not put it into the blockchain and then, oh, look at that, they tricked the blockchain, okay? Um, this guy, Kai Stinkholm, has got a great, um, great phrase in there and he says, you know, everybody says that blockchains are, they wave them around like they're magical integrity wands. And uh, I've been saying this for a long time, like, you know, blockchain, they don't do what everyone's saying that they do, okay? They're just a ledger. They're an immutable ledger. Now, this guy is sort of wrong because he actually has another good point. He says that uh, basically nobody has ever come up with an idea where uh, a blockchain is the answer for, uh, or is the only answer uh, for their, you know, entrepreneurial problem. I'll tell him right now that I have uh, I have dozens of those. Uh, the 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 thing that pisses me off about this is that I have dozens of these that I've been working on for years, and I just sort of assumed that everybody else understood cryptocurrencies, and so they'd start building them, um, but they haven't. And so the the whole point of a, an immutable ledger is it just acts as record keeping. So for any sort of um, activity, entrepreneurial activity, where you need proof of something, like you can put it on a blockchain for a couple of cents. So like the the entrepreneurial ideas that I have, they're all about creating. Um, basically, uh, entrepreneurial social networks where you create some part of a company or something that could be used as a, a product later on. You create a part of a product and then you put proof that you created this part of a product on a blockchain just to say, hey, this is my idea. And so later on, someone else can come along and use your idea and they can give you, uh, you know, partial ownership in whatever product they use that they used your idea in. Okay. And I know that's kind of complicated and I've made, you know, like 40 minute videos on it. So that doesn't explain it well, but there do exist actual blockchain based businesses that necessarily require a blockchain okay because the one that i just explained there like if you try and do something like that like where you create a business and you give out partial ownership to multiple people you need lawyers involved and it's going to cost you you know five to six figures for every product you try and create doing that but if you do it with a blockchain all you have to do is put a, put a few transactions on a blockchain it's going to cost you like you know between one to ten cents so it's an it's an increase in efficiency by six orders you know five to six to seven orders of magnitude it's a massive increase in efficiency so there do exist actual blockchain based businesses that um, you know they require blockchains and they wouldn't exist otherwise so this guy's a little bit wrong here but uh, moving on um, you know, 90% of crypto, it's based on these impossible lies. And this goes back to the decentralized and trustless misunderstanding. Uh, and this guy nails it in this uh, article, too. He, he talks about, like, if you're buying an ebook with a smart contract, that doesn't mean that, you know, nothing can go wrong. If you guys remember the Ethereum hack of the, the DAO or whatever, the DAO, um, they got, like, $150 million stolen from them. Smart contracts are only as smart as the people who, uh, who program them. So, you know, to pretend otherwise is it's really kind of stupid. Um... 
moving on to the next five points. Um, this one, uh, I'm specifically talking about Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, uh, or Bitcoin BCH, you know, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, the reason why I want to bring this up is because this is the original vision of how Bitcoin was supposed to be created. And so I was super excited when it came out. But even the people, like the outside developers on Bitcoin Cash, people who create things like Memo.Cash, and there's one like, or I don't remember, there's like a block press or something, uh, a bunch of Twitter basically uncensorable versions versions of Twitter, they're all building them completely wrong. They're building these applications like the, in the most retarded ways possible. And what I mean by this is if you want to tweet using uh, memo cache or block press or whatever, you have to pay a transaction fee for every tweet. And this is mentally retarded. And the reason why it's mentally retarded is because you don't need to make sure every single tweet you have can never be censored to have an uncensorable version of Twitter. All you have to have is some method of proving that the website you're going to hasn't censored anyone yet, okay? And so you don't have to have a transaction for every single fucking tweet. You can do a hash of a person's transactions for an entire month, for a year, for a week. Um, and you know, you don't want to force users to, like, you don't want to be like, oh, we just do a hash of every single tweet you've done for a month and that's it. You want to give users the options because maybe some people do want to, you know, put every single tweet they have on the blockchain. But these these websites like MemoCache and BlockPress, they don't even give you an option. It's like you have to put every single tweet you want on a blockchain. And it's kind of like, imagine if you went to a uh, mechanic shop and every time you went to this mechanic shop, they changed your oil and you're like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, I, you got my oil, I got my my oil changed a week ago and they're like oh well but this is new oil it's better it's like well technically speaking it's true um, that if you're you've been running your car on the same oil for a week if you get new oil the new oil oil will do better for your car uh, it's completely unnecessary okay and so that's what people like with memo cash and block press they're basically scam artists and I'm not saying like they're malevolent scam artists I'm saying they're stupid scam artists because they're just trying to get everyone to use the blockchain as much as possible but that's not like users of things like Twitter or social media sites are not trying to put as much of their information on a blockchain as possible. All that they want is a social media site that they're not going to get censored on. So start building that shit, guys. You know, start lowering fees for people by batching a bunch of tweets into one hash, and then putting that hash on the blockchain and then just saying, hey, if you want to make sure that you haven't been censored, you know, link or like link all your tweets together or put all your tweets into one text file, hash that text file, and this is, you know, then your hash is has to match the hash that we put on the blockchain and you can do you know you can do a hash of a person's tweets like I said it can be every tweet they do it can be one hash of all their tweets for that day it can be one hash for all their tweets of that week one hash for all their tweets of that month or all, all the their tweets of that year you know you gotta give them an option and the Bitcoin Cash developers, like they're building, they're building smart contracts like they're working on Ethereum. You guys are not working on Ethereum. You're working on Bitcoin Cash. Ethereum's trying to be a world computer. That's an impossible task. You can never do it. Bitcoin Cash, it's a uh, world ledger. It's a completely different thing. You don't try to do computations on the uh, Bitcoin Cash blockchain. And I know that's sort of weird because the computation for something like Twitter is just putting out text. It's just putting out text, which you can technically do on the blockchain, but you don't want to. You want to put hashes of a large amount of text. Okay, so I've seen people put things up on uh, the Bitcoin Cash Reddit pages where they're like, oh, I want to put things like the Bible on the uh, blockchain. And it's like, how, how much money would that cost me? And it's like, you could spend like 20 or 30 or, you know, a, you could spend a lot of money trying to put all, the, all that on there if you try to put every single you know, line of text actually on the blockchain, or you could just hash the entire Bible, put the hash of the Bible on the blockchain, that costs you literally like less than one cent and you're done. You understand what I'm saying? Like, like the people, the developers on, the outside developers on Bitcoin Cash do not understand what they're doing. And they're making a terrible user experience because they're trying to be like, oh, let's do everything on the blockchain because that's what we crypto enthusiasts want. You're not building your goddamn applications for crypto enthusiasts. You're building it for people who don't give a shit about blockchains, okay? They don't give a shit how many... Uh, uh, of their tweets make it to the blockchain they just want to make sure it's uncensored and again if you batch all these tweets into one hash then you can ensure that they uh keep their twitter uncensored without making them pay like ten dollars a fucking month to use the goddamn service okay 
The other thing is they got to put things like advertisements in there because if you actually did hash, like let's say you, for every month, for every user, you put a hash of that user's tweets for the month, you put that hash on the blockchain. If you had advertisements on your websites, then you wouldn't even have to have users, you know, fund their accounts with Bitcoin Cash. You could just pay for their own transact or their hashes of their um, tweets going on a blockchain through the advertisement money, but they're not doing it. Next point I want to talk about is the uh, privacy coin protocol embarrassment. So privacy coins, if you know much about privacy coins, you should be very bearish on, on crypto in general. Um, the top privacy coins are not actually even privacy coins. If you look at something like Verge, it literally has no privacy protocol. It does nothing. It's just a meme coin and it's one of the top coins and people think it's a privacy coin because it offers you you know the protection of things like Tor. You can technically speaking use Tor on any crypto. It takes a little bit of work. Um, other privacy coins though have also give you easy options to use Tor like Zcoin. It's literally click a button on Zcoin you're using Tor just like Verge. Um, except the difference between Zcoin and Verge is Zcoin has an actual privacy like a zero knowledge privacy protocol. Um, so the privacy on Zcoin is exponentially higher than Verge. It's hard to say that Verge is all that private. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the prices of something like Verge and Zcoin, it just will boggle your mind. And then if you move on to different things, like if you actually talk about privacy protocols of some of the top zero knowledge coins, like let's look at the ZK Snark protocol of things like Zcash and Zencash. So ZK Snarks, um, there's no way to ensure that uh, coins haven't been duplicated. This is one of the biggest issues in crypto in general because if something like Zcash or Zencash gets used as the world currency, then the most powerful man in the world is the man who or who figures out a duplication bug in that cryptocurrency. They literally become more powerful than any man has ever become in the history of mankind. Okay, so if they don't figure out a way to stop this duplication problem, um, it's a super dangerous thing to ever have something like a ZK Snark coin, like Zcash or Zencash, become a world reserve currency. It's probably the most dangerous thing that mankind has ever seen. And people don't even talk about this. And if you bring this up with people who have bought Zcash or ZK Snark coins, they don't know what they're talking about. Now, I'm not saying don't invest in these coins. Um, I actually just recently invested in an ASIC miner for, uh, for Equash coins. Um, I think they've got good potential, and if they can figure out how to stop this problem, um, you know, they'll, they will be useful. Uh, but until then, you know, there's no reason that these should have the price that they do, or at least, uh, I mean, they should sort of have the price that they do. But if you look at something like uh, the Zero Coin Protocol, the Zero Coin Protocol has the same privacy. It actually has slightly better privacy than the ZK Snark protocol, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it's got better privacy, and there's no worry about having all your coins inflated away into nothingness. So um, it's overall just a much better protocol, and people just don't know it or understand. Like, if you look at people like Edward Snowden, he started talking about how Zcash could be really good. Well, I don't know, like you'd think someone like Edward Snowden would know things like this, but he doesn't, you know. The one thing that I can tell you about computer science people is that they seriously do not f seem to understand a goddamn thing about what they do. Um, you know, Edward Snowden's talking about, you know, you can track Bitcoin, and it, uh, if we go back to the, the privacy differences between the ZeroCoin protocol and ZK Snarks, uh, the vast majority of people who use ZK Snark coins, uh, they're completely traceable even when they use the shielded transactions because with ZK Snarks, um, there's it, there's no actual mixing of the coins. So like if you try if you take out you know 1.256 Zcash and you move it to a shielded transaction, uh, you can still see that someone moved 1.256. Zcash back away from a shielded transaction back to the public transactions and then you can trace those coins and they actually do that quite a bit um, and if you look at something like zero coin with zero coin when you create your zero coin uh, it already mixes up your zero coin into different denominations so zero coin by definition uh, as of right now it's more private than Zcash it's more private it's more secure um, oh and the other thing is that Zcash and ZK snarks if you use the uh, the shielded transactions, it takes one to two minutes for a transaction. So you cannot use uh, Zcash and Zencash in retail environments, but you can with ZeroCoin. So ZeroCoin is superior in every single aspect, literally every aspect that you can hope for or that you know you weigh privacy coins by, that you measure privacy coins by. It's superior, but the price is way lower. And if you talk to people about things like it, like the Nobody fucking understands this shit, okay? Nobody does. And this is basic shit. You know, people like Zuko Wilcox has talked about these problems a million times. Why the hell is a coin that is, by definition, inferior in every way 
uh, higher price than the superior coin. I don't know. You know, the privacy coins are a fucking embarrassment right now. Um, just which coins are dominating and which ones are not. <clears throat> Somebody's going to bring up something like, oh, Monero is a good privacy coin. It's things like Monero, too. Like, if you don't have a public layer on your blockchain, you the only thing you're good for, basically, is for contraband. And I'm an anarchist, so I think that's cool and all, but you can't audit Monero's blockchain. There's no, like, it's, with something like Zcoin, even ZK Snarks, if you use the public blockchain, like, you can prove with a, beyond a shadow of, beyond a shadow of a doubt, in a public forum, you can prove that, you know, what, your finances are correct and you're not lying about your finances. You can't do that with Monero. There's trust involved with everything you do with Monero because there's no public blockchain. So, based, like, Monero, I, I enjoy Monero, I think it's a decent coin, but it should always be secondary to all privacy coins that have public blockchains. Uh, I think Monero, you know, it could last for long. I'm actually not a big fan of Monero itself. I prefer Monero Classic or the ASIC versions of Monero. Uh, Monero is kind of an SJW coin to me, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I prefer the I prefer the ASIC versions. Um, next thing I want to talk about is a thousand crypto dilution problem. So we have cryptos all over the place for every goddamn thing. I can't stop getting all these ads for cryptocurrencies there's currently one called cash bet that keeps on fucking playing for me and it's like create your own casino legal casino game thing using our blockchain it's like you guys fucking realize that you can use any cryptocurrency for a betting game right like you don't need a cryptocurrency for a betting game uh, or you don't need a cryptocurrency specific or blockchain specific for your betting game all you need is some sort of money that works for your website it doesn't even have to be crypto. Crypto seems to work better for betting websites, but you don't need to create a specific fucking blockchain for it. And it gets fucking old. And then all these ICOs that are technically securities and they try to pretend like they're cryptocurrencies. Like, I don't know. There's thousands of cryptocurrencies. And by definition of the way money works, you might have eight or so in the end that survive. You'll have your one main one. You might have one or two that are competing with your main one. And then you'll probably have secondary coins that have secondary functions uh, as of right now it seems like privacy coins will fulfill those secondary functions because you know if you look at something like bitcoin cash it does have privacy functions in it um, but you can get perfect privacy uh, with something like bitcoin cash through atomic swaps and so um, you know atomic swaps give a lot of reasons for privacy coins to exist even if they're not the coin that gets used as the reserve currency because, um, you know, like Bitcoin Cash, they use Cash Shuffle. Cash Shuffle is only as useful as it, for as many people use it. So if not a lot of people are using it, it's better to just get an anonymity through using atomic swaps with, like, zero-knowledge cryptocurrencies or, you know, ZK Snark stuff, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But um, next thing I want to talk about is 50% uh, of crypto is just a promise. This is a legitimate stat. It's actually 47%. 47% of cryptocurrency is vaporware. And that's not a joke. It's literally nothing but a promise. Okay, if you look at the top 100, about half of them, like, they don't even have a working product out. They're just like, we're going to create a product sometime in the future. And people buy that shit. Like, what the fuck are we doing, guys? Like, <laughs> oh, I promise you later on I'm going to give you a product. Oh, hey, let's let's make this guy a billionaire. Yeah, he's, he's promising us stuff. Ha, ha, ha. He deserves to be a billionaire. Um, but then moving on. The last and final point is the block reward unit of count problem. Now, this is the only problem that no one is trying to solve. Now, I've made a bunch of videos on this and how to solve this. Uh, you do it through a variable hash rate block reward where your block reward is linked to the hash rate. Um, but the issue with uh, the block rewards in all cryptocurrencies right now, um, the only one that gets sort of close to solving this is... Um, I think it's actually Ethereum and Dogecoin. But Ethereum and Dogecoin are going to fail for other reasons. But um, the issue here is that once a block reward drops to zero... Uh, your currency will never function as a unit of account, and even when, like, the way block rewards currently are, they have no relation to market demand, so it doesn't matter how much demand there is for cryptocurrencies, the amount of cryptocurrencies that is created stays constant. Uh, this is retarded, like, this is communism. Uh, this is the one part of cryptocurrency that is complete communism, where they, it's completely dictated beyond market forces. Uh, the block reward is just completely constant, and there's no reason for this. And the big issue with this is that when you have a lot of demand for cryptocurrency, since there's no change in supply, Jordan Belfort actually has a lot of good uh, talks on this, but 
since there's no change in the supply that is mined, when your demand spikes, so does price. And when demand drops, price drops insanely quickly. And I, I said this at the beginning, like a bunch of merchants are dropping Bitcoin because of, uh, one, it's not useful. Like Bitcoin BTC, it was never, you couldn't depend on it when fees got high and congestion got high. But two, the volatility is shitty for any sort of merchant. And you will always have volatility so long as the uh, block reward is not dependent upon market demand. Um, and no cryptocurrency as of right now has tried to solve this problem really. Again, Ethereum and and uh, Dogecoin do okay because they have a more constant block reward that the percentage doesn't really drop as much. And that's better, but it's still not dependent, dependent upon market demand. Um, so it's still not very good. But anyways, uh, I'm still very, like, for a very long time I've been bearish on Bitcoin and BTC. Uh, I, like, I'm... Bitcoin Cash has made me sort of bullish on crypto, but the way that the developers are trying to make it, like, I don't know. We, we need a bear market. We need a bear market to get stupid money and stupid people out of this goddamn space because we're not doing everything that we were supposed to be doing. Okay, I expected a lot more out of cryptocurrency after all these years. and we're, The progress is stunningly slow. Um, again... I don't really like to make a huge amount of predictions because you can never predict markets. So people are, you know, I'm not saying sell all your, your crypto right now. If you wanted to sell, you should have sold, you know, a while back. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm more waiting for buying opportunities right now than I am trying to advocate for selling. But uh, the cryptocurrency community as a whole is just, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed at all. Um, nobody's doing anything correctly. Um, you know, there's a couple of people within the Bitcoin Cash community community that are doing things all right, but just as a whole, this this entire market makes no fucking sense. But anyways, uh, that's the end of this video. Uh, I'll have some more coming out soon.